day before when I did this. So this should help you a lot. And so we are recording it. I'm going to do it down here. I want to show you something that I drew on the board. Can you, can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. Let me watch it a little bit. All right. So you this is kind of important to understand in order to stand what, like what the endocrine system is doing. And I really think this helps people kind of lock it into their mind. One of the things that you must realize is that the hypothalamus will scan the body and it will say, what do we need? What do we need any hormones? Right. And if the thyroid needs a hormone or something else, it'll report back to the pituitary and say, Hey, you need to send this hormone. So the pituitary is actually the master gland that sends out the hormone. Uh, so, and it hangs right below the hypothalamus. If you were to actually look at it um, in, real in real life, which I did, the, the brain sits like this and the pituitary sits right almost in the middle. But if you were to look at underneath it, it looks like it has a plastic Lego. It's like a little piece, it's called a celica turnica. It has a little hole in it and it's a little white plastic Lego looking thing that, that this pituitary gland hangs out of. And what happens is, let's just say the hypothalamus says, all right, thyroid, we need some TSH, right? So we, the anterior pituitary shoots out TSH. The target is the thyroid. Then the target shoots out something, T3 and T4. Now, this is what I want to show you because um, if you as nurses are running a thyroid panel on someone and we're looking at T, TSH, T3, and T4, but if we get that report back and TSH is, is messed up, it's, it's off, either high or low, uh, where would the problem be if this lab was off? The pituitary? Yes, ma'am. It would be the anterior pituitary. Where would the problem be if the T3 and T4 were off? Thyroid. Yes. So we have to understand that when we're using these hormones, we're targeting a organ and then the organ itself is shooting out something to the body. Okay. Um, so we have our ACTH, which is our adrenal cortotropic hormone. Now, this is really important. I, I'm going to explain something here. It shoots out and off the anterior pituitary and it hits the adrenal cortex. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit. Where is the adrenal cortex? Where is it? I'm gonna tell you where it is, okay? <laughs> it's on top of the kidney. Do you see like this little trunk? Here's my kidney. I know that doesn't look like a kidney, but here it is. <laughs> And then we've got our adrenal gland sits on top of the kidney. It's like a triangle, okay? On this adrenal gland, you have the outer portion, which is called the cortex, and you have the inner portion, which is called the medulla. Now, both of these facts are important on this test, okay? Um, when you have ACTH, you're gonna target the cortex. You're gonna target the outer portion here. When that hormone hits the cortex, it's going to shoot out mineral corticoids and glutocorticoids. Now, I try to keep those straight because you, your body will go into cardiovascular collapse if you don't have mineral corticoids and glutocorticoids. Uh, what disease doesn't have enough ACTH? Do you remember? Is it added? Yeah, you don't, you don't hesitate. You're smart. Addison's <laughs> disease does not have enough ACTH. So when Addison's disease, they're not putting out their mineral corticoids and glutocorticoids. Now, what's important about that is the glutocorticoids for the body are for inflammation. But you know, glutocorticoids raise sugar in the body, right? When we're under stressful situations, we tend to shoot out glutocorticoids. And that's what kind of holds fat in our body. Because you know, if you were to give actually somebody a glutocorticoid, which is prednisone, what does it do to their body, right? It's kind of similar mm -hmm. to our own production of steroids. This mineral corticoid though, it controls salt and water balance in our body. Uh, you probably learned that in farm. 
So this person with Addison's is deficient in both of these types of steroids. Now, we're gonna hit the target of the cortex and don't get confused on the test because there is a medulla and there is a cortex, okay? But with ACTH, we hit the cortex and then it shoots out our steroids. And you have to know mineral corticoids and glutocorticoids are the steroids that it hits. Now later, you're gonna learn about a pheochrysitoma. That's actually on your uh, blueprint, okay? That is a tumor on the adrenal medulla. Now, what? Here's, here's how to understand this. If you have a tumor on the adrenal medulla, look what you're shooting out of the medulla. You're shooting out epi and norepi. That's your fight or flight, right? So mm -hmm. if your patient had a pheochrysitoma, what is that? What's a pheochrysitoma? Hmm. What is the five H's? It's, it's a tumor on the adrenal medulla, right? You're shooting out epi and norepi. So with a pheochrysitoma, you would see high blood pressure, extremely high. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So we get, remember, guys, I am recording this so you can go back and look at this. But um, we got FSH and LH, and I don't know how much she'll talk about those, but they come off the anterior. And she's going to ask you, which ones come off anterior, which ones come off posterior, okay? So you really got to know what's coming off of where. These LH and FSH, I'm going to explain it to you in terms of the ovary. Uh, men make FSH and LH and women do too. These are called gonadotropins. So if you hear the term gonadotropin, then we're talking about FSH and LH. Um, what they do is once a month for a female, this is why I like to say the female because it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, we hit the ovary with something. And it's FSH. There is not just eggs floating around in the ovary like everybody thinks. What there is is follicles in here. And so once a month, a follicle stimulating hormone hits the ovary, produces, this follicle starts to produce an egg. It goes through a little, uh, you know, what do I want to say, systemic thing to produce an egg. And as this egg starts to pop out of the ovary, then the body sends in luteinizing hormone and says, no more children. We don't want any more. Uh, you know, but sometimes two eggs pass out and then you get uh, twins or triplets or whatever. Um, that's why people who are, um, you know, they can't get pregnant and then they go take gonadotropins. They take some hormones to help stimulate the production of an egg. Well, they may produce many, many eggs. And so they, they don't really, they can't stop it with a luteinizing hormone. But once a month, FSH hits and then luteinizing hormone comes in. That's our gonadotropins, okay? She definitely is gonna hit you on growth hormone. Growth hormone uh, targets the bone and the muscle. And then what shoots out of the bone and muscle, I don't have drawn out here, is uh, somatotropin. Remember, uh, you're a very small person and we've got to stimulate the growth of soma, somatotropin for growth. She's not going to ask you prolactin, I don't believe, unless she just says what ones come off anterior pituitary. You just have to know prolactin comes off of there. Now, a lot of people will get, and prolactin is for breast milk. You're going to get that in, well, you probably already had it in OB. So I don't think she's going to ask on that, but you're going to, a lot of people get mixed up with ADH and ACTH. Do not do that. Okay because uh, they'll get on their test and they'll be like, oh yeah, and they're looking at the wrong thing. So ADH, if you can remember, you pee out your back. ADH off the posterior, okay? Um, so the only reason that you and I are not peeing out all of our fluid in our body is because our ADH hormone is working correctly. It only allows about 30 mils per hour out of our body. And we can look at our eyes and nose as nurses and say, gosh, their ADH hormones probably working pretty good. It's only allowing out this much fluid. 
So what happens is ADH will be shot out of the posterior pituitary and the target is the kidney. Then the kidney does something, it shoots out vasopressin. And that, I'm gonna keep in mind, it just presses the pee. So it doesn't allow you to pee out everything. Um, so our body regulates this and it, you know, as we go throughout the day, it, it's regulating this pee through this vasopressin. And then you've got oxytocin comes off of the posterior pituitary, okay? And you guys know these both, prolactin and oxytocin, y'all have had. So she's probably not going to target it other than that she's going to ask you what comes off anterior, what comes off posterior, okay? How are y'all feeling about that? Okay. Pretty good? Okay, mm -hmm. so let me, let me say one more thing here. A lot of times when you get on the test, you're looking for T3 and T4. I don't think she's going to put it like that because the boards don't put it like that. They say thyroxine or they say thyroxine. Uh, T3 has T-R-I-I. -I. There's two I's in T3, okay? So if you see the word and it says T-R-I-I, -I, she's talking about T3. And if you see um, T4, it's thyroxine. So just be aware that there is an actual other name to it. Uh, when you get on your board, you're going to need to know that. Okay, so let's do this. Let's go. I just want to show you, because you were saying that you're putting things side by side, okay? Let me zoom in. And this is why it's super important. Let's zoom in a little bit. This, to me, is extremely important because you have to be able to know that if you're going to treat this person, we hope to get to normal, which is to the center but we could send them over to this side and vice versa. If we treat graves, we hope to go to normal, but we could send them over here. So what's important to understand is if we're going to give levothyroxine for Hashimoto's, it's going to lift the thyroid and we're hoping to normal, but levothyroxine, uh, anytime you deal with thyroid, you're going to have to titrate the medicine because it's going to mess up. If we're going to lift the thyroid and hope to go to normal, what signs and symptoms would we watch for if we were going to give levo? Tell me, what do you think? If we're going to lift the, if we're going to give medicine over here, levo, I don't have it listed here. When we lift the thyroid, what signs and symptoms would we watch for? We would then watch for hyperthyroidism. Yes, exactly. So we've got to know what hyperthyroid is. That's why when you're when you're treating low, we got to watch for the high. When we're treating high, we got to watch for the symptoms of low. You got it. Now, look here. I want to show you something that's super important also for her is that um, sometimes she'll say, okay, PSH targets the thyroid, comes off anterior pituitary. Do you see how I have that all there? On the low side, now this is kind of tricky with thyroid. And when I became a nurse, like working, and we did thyroid panel and I'm like, it took me a minute to figure out why this is the way it is. If your thyroid is low, look at what your TSH is. It is high. So what is happening and the T3 or T4 are low. Uh, so if we got a thyroid issue, our TSH is going from the anterior, it's like trying to give the thyroid what it needs because the body's not getting it. Look, T3 and T4 are given off by the thyroid. So they're low. When they're talking low thyroid, they're talking about what's coming off of the actual thyroid. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the pituitary is saying, wow, we're low in thyroid. Let's give it. Let's give TSH. And it's giving it to the thyroid, but the thyroid itself is not working and your T3 and T4 would be low, okay? So remember, I, I don't know if you remember, but the other day I said you're either going to Japan or the grave. Hashi, because I think of the low, slow karate chop movies I used to see, you know, as a kid, as a teenager, everything's down, everything. Uh, the main thing, I this is, was LVN, so I didn't put it on here, but um, <clears throat> they have to do the same thing as you. Uh, everything on this side of the body becomes cold, slow, heavy, 
you know, you start to lose your hair. And that's why I said, go to your book and look at your signs and symptoms. And I'll even show you my notes here in a minute. We'll go over it. And then right over here on graves, uh, everything sped up. You're hot. I mean, you can be excessively hot, right? So mm -hmm. let's look at the very worst case scenario on both sides. If you go super low on your thyroid, there's something called myxedema. Keep that with Hashimoto's, okay? Uh, what would you see if you were having a myxedema? What would the body temperature look like? Isn't it like above, or it's super low? Super low, super low, okay? If you have the very worst scenario over here to Graves, what would the body temperature look like? Super hot. Yeah, see how, see how you have to think? You're going to see signs and symptoms, and then she's going to give you something like really, uh, you're going to get super high fever. I think she uses like 102, 103, but 106 could be a thyroid storm. Um, there are some um, other names for thyroid storm if she uses them. What's called thyroid crisis or thyroid toxicosis, which is not on here. Um, this is exactly why I wanted you to see this written side by side. Now, I would add medicines here. I would add signs and symptoms here. Um, just so that you got this full picture of what you're looking at. Over on this side, do you see your T3 and T4 are what? Up and your thyroid is down. You know what makes me think that she's going to ask you this? Because this is a board's question. There is a question that I went through with a student and it asked about TSH up or down and what would you see and what would that be? It was like really mind twisting. So remember over here, TSH, the, the actual pituitary gland probably isn't working, but the thyroid is trying to give the body more. I'm going to say this is Graves might be actually more of a pituitary issue because of this right here, but hold me to that part. <laughs> if, you, if you got this, look here, ACTH, remember what we just talked about? You need to be able to talk about it just like I'm talking about it. You need to say ACTH comes off anterior pituitary and it hits the adrenal cortex. Where is that? On top of the kidney. Woohoo! Okay, so the two diseases that go with this are what? Addison's and Cushing's, right? So, you know, Addison's and Cushing's, we're going to talk about it because when you are on this test, you're going to have to know your electrolytes that are up and down. And here in a minute, I'm going to show you that. But if you go to the very severe low Addison's, which is severely low steroids, you could go into what's called a cardiovascular collapse. Um, not a good thing. We're going to talk about that too, okay? Okay. Um, I just put this out to the side because remember I talked about a tumor on the adrenal medulla and that's called a pheocrasatoma. Some people say it different. That's how I like to say it. But remember, there could be a tumor on the medulla. Um, we've got, let's see here, ADH. Where does that come off the pituitary, the pituitary, the pituitary at? The posterior. Yeah, you pee out your back, right? So having to do with pee, right? Diabetes insipidus has nothing, this is a board's question, has nothing to do with sugar. It has everything to do with antidiuretic hormone, okay? And I think because it's a board's question, she's gonna want you to know that. Um, SIADH, so right here, I'm just giving you a little synapse so that you get a, a picture. In diabetes sipidus, you're peeing a lot. Over here, SIADH, you're not peeing, okay? Growth hormone, same thing. Uh, you don't have to know Sidman's disease, the LVNs that I drew this for did, but if you have low growth hormone dwarfism, and if you have you know, high growth hormone, you've got acromegalia or giantism. And if we have, now this is, I know you can't really see this, but if you have an overproduction of growth hormone, remember, we're going to 
chop the tree down with octreotide. We'll talk about that. But we may have to remove the pituitary gland. And they, that's called a hyphosectomy. Now, all these things are on your blueprint. I'm not telling you anything that's not on your blueprint. Okay. So um, let me go here. Let's look at this last one. Parathyroid. Now, she's going to ask you about parathyroid. The reason why I kind of separated it out is where is the parathyroid gland? It's like right behind the thyroid. Actually, it's inside the thyroid. Okay. Two dots in each lobe. And remember, the parathyroid is not shot. It's not, the pituitary gland does not shoot the parathyroid. It's not, there's nothing there. The parathyroid all by itself works in conjunction with the thyroid gland which is weird because the thyroid controls a lot of stuff. But what you're going to see is the parathyroid wants to raise calcium in the body. So it will put out calcitrol. I say you calcitrol up calcium, okay? But the thyroid says, whoa, I need to be in control of this calcium. So I'm going to produce some calcitonin when the calcium gets too high. So the cal the the thyroid will actually produce calcitonin to lower calcium, okay? So remember, if you're dealing with parathyroid hormone, we're not being shot by the pituitary. We're dealing with the two little dots in each lobe on the thyroid, and they're controlling our calcium. All right, so that was kind of a simple thing, and if you didn't get it, you can actually go back and watch this video. It's gonna be real simple, um, but we're gonna go here and we're going to hit exactly, well, we are going to hit it. We're going to hit exactly what you need to know here, okay? So I am going to go to, all right, okay. So now I want us just to take a general look. You're the nurse. You don't know what's going on with your patient. They come in, they're giving you a lot of like signs and symptoms or whatever. And that's how it's going to be on the test, okay? Uh, when we're talking, uh, if we took, if we said something about the person says, I'm really tired, I'm really fatigued, what could that be? Um, my, the doctor check. That would be your, with Hashimoto and... Woo, woo, Samantha, very good. <laughs> so energy level will, will play a role here in our metabolism hormone, which is TSH, right? And so our energy level, heat and cold, what are we looking at, do you think? The patient comes in and says, I'm just so cold all the time. Uh, thyroid. Yes, thyroid. You're in a thyroid panel. Do you see how you got to start thinking like a nurse? Uh, if our menstrual cycle is messed up, what might we look at? Maybe FSH and LH? Uh, memory, sleep pattern, mood change, concentration, all these I'm just saying that we need to get a good health, health history. Um, and then it says, what are some things the doctor's going to run? Okay. So the doctor could run blood, get some blood work done, your analysis. We can, uh, it says stimulation or suppression for hyper or hypo on some of the, some of the glands, but we could also run some imaging studies. Now on this kind of jumps around a little bit, but, um, I'm just going to tell you, we need to come know what comes off anterior and what comes off posterior. So I'm going to come down to this real quick. Remember, you are going to miss a test question if you can't tell what comes off anterior, what comes off posterior. So we talked about this already, what they do, and um, it says it right out here. ACTH stimulates the adrenal cortical hormone. TSH stimulates the secretion of the thyroid hormone. So when we hit the target, the target then shoots out something. I do think she's going to ask you about FSH and LH. See, I think she's going to ask you about prolactin, but I think it's just going to be what one comes off anterior. And then you got the two that comes off posterior, right? Oh, girls, look at this. Remember how I said T3 and T4? Mm -hmm. Thiodithyroxine is T3 and thyroxine is T4. Another thing that's important about the thyroid 
is calcitonin. Why is the thyroid putting that out? To tone down the calcium, right? And the parathyroid glands are separate. They're inside the thyroid and they actually are con in control of bringing up our calcium. So very, very important for this test just to know what you're looking at, where it's coming from. Um, all right, let's look down here. Hold on just a minute. I know it's starting off with hyphosectomy here. So let's just go with that. What does that mean? What does that word mean? We're gonna give a hyphosectomy. Which, what are we gonna do? Here it is, it's written right here. Y'all can read it. Remove the pituitary. We gotta take the pituitary gland out. Oh my gosh. What is the pituitary gland responsible for? Everything. Yeah, these hormones. You're gonna take the pituitary gland out? You're gonna have to replace a ton of hormones, right? Probably not first choice to do that. We're probably gonna see if they have a benign tumor, just leave the tumor, uh, just so that the other hormones can still function in the body. But here's the deal. If they do have to take it, they do what's called the transphenoidal approach. They go up through the gum and back into the middle of the brain, right? So let's look at our post-op care. I do think she's going to ask you post-op questions on a hyphosectomy. Uh, if we look, elevate the head of the bed. Don't remove your nasal packing. There's going to be a little drip pad under your nose called a mustache dressing. Uh, you don't want to sneeze. You don't want to cough. You don't want to vomit. Um, we'll have them breathe through their mouth. So they're going to need good oral care. Okay. Um, guys, you can, you, you guys, if y'all, I know y'all are writing madly, but you can rewatch and pause. Okay. So if you just want to listen to the most of it and then go back and write, you certainly can. Um, administer mild analgesics for headache. Look at this. Assess for what? Ooh, why are we watching for a cerebral spinal fluid leak? We went into the brain, into the brain and we pulled out the pituitary. That's pretty serious. How would we know it's a CSF leak? They start getting a headache and then we test the fluid for sugar. Yes, very, very good. Okay, so um, make sure we know that for sure. If you got the headache, right? Don't, if we're going through transphenoidal, make sure you know that soft toothbrushes um, no bending, no stooping, no toothbrushing until the sutures are removed. That might be important. Um, they are at risk for a hematoma. So we're going to watch their neurofunction. Um, why would be, why would we be worried about their vision? Why would we be worried about their optic nerve? That could be another something she asked because you're going to the middle of the brain. The optic nerve is right in there and it could swell. Mm -hmm. So blood or swelling can push up on the optic nerve. So we gotta make sure their vision is good. Um, make sure that they replace their electrolytes. One of the things that's interesting to me is that when you have to remove the pituitary, look what you really assess for immediately. Diabetes and syphilis. What do you think you would see with somebody who doesn't have their pituitary because we just removed it? They're dry inside. Look right here. Dry, maybe they're peeing out all their fluid. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, so when we do remove this pituitary gland, we're going to look at the urine. Urine specific gravity is measured after you void. Tell me what is specific gravity in the urine? What if I said your urine specific gravity was low, what would your urine look like? Wouldn't it be more clear? It'd be like water. It'd be just like clear, mm -hmm. getting rid of the poisons. If I said your specific gravity was high, what would it look like? Dark. <laughs> Dark, right. So if you're looking at this, we're going to take out the pituitary. We're going to watch for diabetes and sepsis is going to show up right away. And then our daily weight is the best indicator 
of how much fluid balance we have, right? Here's a little picture, transphenoidal. It doesn't look very fun. Uh, you know, you can go through the mouth, you can go through the upper lip, or you can go through the nose. And that's right there in the center of the brain. That little bitty tiny pituitary is so important in our body. So here, because of this, the first thing we're going to watch, let's look. And this is what your notes need to look like. Okay. Um, you can stop this video and make sure that you get this. So I want you to see that with diabetes insipidus, you have low antidiuretic hormone. Does that make sense that it would be low? Mm -hmm. Over here, obviously it's the high, but look at your specific gravity. This is where she's gonna focus. Normal specific gravity should be 1.0110, I'm gonna say 10 to 1.030. Uh, that's probably normal. But if your specific gravity is this number, that is very low. That means, what would your urine look like? Yeah. It would be very clear. You're just going to be peeing water. It doesn't even have time to go through the kidneys to take the poison out. Look how, well, look at the volume of water. Uh, what is a normal urine output per hour? 30. 30. Yeah, 30 per hour is normal, but look, greater than 250 mils, that's like 10 liter, that's like 10 liters or 20 liters in a day. You can't let you only have five liters of blood. Yeah, that's a lot of fluid, right? So we're gonna, it says, look what this is. No fluid restriction. They will be severely dehydrated. So you're gonna see, oh, look at this. I don't know if you were there or not, but if you'll remember. When you get dehydrated, your blood gets thicker, right? So the salt content goes up. They get hypernatremia. Uh, your heart rate would go up. Your blood pressure would go down. Everything looks really dry with diabetes insipidus. Over here, now you may have, and it says polydipsia. I don't think polydipsia. What is polydipsia? You may not have any polydipsia because this is peeing. So take that one off. I would say low urine output or no urine output. Um, fluid restriction. We're going to, you know why? Tell me why. If we're not putting out any fluid, why are we going to hold fluid from them? Wouldn't you, think, wouldn't you think we would give them fluid? Well, they're already swollen and you don't want it to go to their brain. Why are they, and where, why and where are they swollen? Mm. Mm -hmm. does it have does it have to do with this the salt low salt okay mm -hmm. when your bloodstream has low salt what's a normal salt level 135 mm -hmm. to 145 okay i'm gonna y'all remember this if you'll be good nurses <laughs> if your salt level goes below 135 and down into like the 120 area you've got huge problems. Salt, water, full of salt. But what happens is when the vessel has low salt, all the water shifts to where there's more salt, which is the cell, okay? The brain has cells, but that compartment in the brain is only so big and you could herniate the brain and they die. So beware that dilutional hyponatremia and now you'll see why the signs and symptoms are confusion, cramping. I would say headache. I would add that in there. Nausea, vomiting, coma. Because they are actually overhydrated. They're not overhydrated in their vessel. They're overhydrated in the cell. Now, a lot of times we don't realize that there's different compartments that hold fluid. And remember, your cell holds about 60% of our body fluid and our vessel only holds about five. So if we get overhydrated, the shift to the cell. So overhydration with low salt is what we watch for. If you're a good nurse, you're gonna pick up on headache, confusion, um, hey, I think she's gonna target that. I do. So remember, SIADH, our salt is low. Don't, don't give them any more fluid. Why no more fluid? 
Because we're gonna we're gonna make the salt less. We're gonna take it down even further when we get fluid. Um, there was a lady. I don't know if y'all remember. Y'all were probably babies or maybe not even born. <laughs> she uh, she wanted to win a prize at this radio station, and they were uh, you know trying to drink like, drink water. like all this water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she died. Why did why did she die from drinking? Because said didn't she not pee it out? No, it's not that. Well, yeah, but where did it go? It put her salt out in her bloodstream and all of the fluid shifted up to her brain, her cells in her brain and it killed her. Uh, so salt is a very important thing as a nurse. Uh, most people don't realize salt's that important. So what would we do for this patient? How are we gonna get the fluid from the cell out into the vessel? Cause we gotta pull it out. Uh, Lasix is good, but um, there is something even better that you can give. And here in a minute, I think we're going to see the medicine. Uh, Vaptin, uh, there's a Vaptin drug that you can give, um, but we can also give 3% hypertonic solution, which is we put more salt in the vessel and then we pull it pulls the fluid from the cell. Uh, we're going to monitor with either one of these diseases, daily weight, eyes and nose, right? And what else? Salt. Super important, right? So if we look, there is a test. So when you guys, so when you're doing your, your side by side, I want you to highlight salt. I want you to highlight output of urine. I want you to highlight um, like eyes and nose, daily weight. I want you to also see something here. What if we're peeing so much? Gosh, we're peeing out 10 liters a day. Let's just say that. How do we stop the pee? The vasopressin. Vasopressin is going to press the vessel so we can't pee out. Very good. If we press the pee with vasopressin right here, could we cause SIADH? Yes. Yes, we could. <laughs> yes, we could. And if we try to get somebody to pee again by giving them a Vaptin or 3% hypertonic solution, could we cause somebody to go back into diabetes insipidus? Yes, we could. So beware that this medicine, vasopressin, presses the pee because, and it immediately, boom, it'll stop them from peeing. It's a nasal spray. They sniff it up their nose. Uh, don't give it to a cardiac patient because Cardiac patients already have trouble with their vessels. And if we're pressing their vessels, not a good idea, right? Uh, they may end up with a nosebleed because of this medicine in their nose. Um, so I would, if, if you happen to have this permanently, this diabetes insipidus, I would wear a medical alert bracelet for sure. You can give fluids because this person's very dehydrated, okay? Because they have a lot of salt in their, in their vessel. They have hypernatremia, which means they're very very, very dehydrated. So look at this, there is a test and I don't know if she's gonna ask, but I think she will. Fluid deprivation test, no fluids for eight to 12 hours. And we're gonna try to see if you have diabetes insipidus. If we don't give you any fluids for eight to 12 hours and you're still peeing out 35% of your body weight, you've got diabetes insipidus, right? Um, it says plasma and urine osmolarity studies are performed at the beginning and the end of the test. The inability to increase the specific gravity and osmolarity of the urine equals DI. What that means is this. That means that if we hold fluid from you and you're still peeing out a lot and the urine stays clear and it doesn't get dark because you're dehydrated, then you got diabetes insipidus. That's the best way I can explain it. So. Mm -hmm. Fault, specific gravity, uh, what are we seeing? These are all really important facts for you, for your test. This is just a nice little like, like P, give IVs over here, stop the P. Uh, so, you know, this little acronyms. But remember, we're really going to P a lot over here and our specific gravity would be down. Usually specific gravity and osmolarity go down together, kind of are the same thing. And then, um, what does it say? Hypovolemia, thirst, tachycardia, blood pressure. I monitor your fluids. 
I, how do y'all feel about that? A little bit. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. make sure we're going to walk our minds around this even more. You're going to have to expose yourself to this content. Okay. So, uh, I mean, more than one time. Here we go. This is our thyroid. Tell me what hormone comes off the uh, in <clears throat> pituitary for that. Uh, Ooh, and then what comes off the thyroid? T3 and T4. Ooh, okay. So look at <laughs> your thyroid. I'm cheering you on. Uh, here's your thyroid right here. But do you see the two, the two little yellow dots here? Mm -hmm. They're the parathyroids. So they're okay. inside the thyroid gland to help control calcium. The thyroid itself is like one of the major metabolism hormone producing things in our body. Um, sometimes a person will get an autoimmune disorder and for some reason it'll cause a problem with a thyroid. So um, we're gonna learn a little bit. I'm gonna scroll down here for just a minute. And I want us to look at hypo and hyperthyroidism. Now, if you're looking back at this, this should say hyper. I don't know how to change it, but there you go. It should be hyper. Um, when you're looking at your signs and symptoms, the first thing that comes to my mind, if I had a patient telling me some signs and symptoms, I would go, oh, body temperature. Remember how I said very, very cold, um, but there are other things, numbness and tingling, voice changes, fatigue. Fatigue and temperature tell me that kind of points me to the thyroid. Everything is slowed down. The person will gain weight for no reason, uh, like weight gain here. Um, so over here, I'm going to say the, the heat intolerance. When you have Graves' disease, you literally look like you're going to the grave. My brother-in-law had it or has it. And I, when I saw him, I said, oh, my gosh. He looked like he would have had a water sprinkler just pouring down his face. He, he just had a cloth with him all the time. He was just sweating profusely. He'd lost tons of weight. And I'm thinking, ooh, you got a couple, you got something. You got Graves' disease, you got cancer or something. So if you look, uh, they're very excitable. They have problems with their eyes. Have y'all seen that commercial thyroid eye disease or exophthalmos? They get like, uh, they get this thyroid eye disease. It's like pressure in their eye, which kind of bulges out their eye. And sometimes they have to tape their eyelids shut when they sleep just so they don't dry out when they're sleeping. Um, they're very apprehensive, hypersensitive. Um, a beta blocker will help this person uh, because everything is so sped up. Um, beta blockers aren't necessarily for blood pressure. Real, I don't know if you realize the, the, uh, quali the unique quali quality of a beta blocker is to pull somebody out of the sympathetic nervous system. So if somebody's like really shaky and hot and their metabolism is high, a beta blocker would be helpful uh, to help that person. Uh, but they're gonna have weight loss, no matter how much they eat, increased appetite, all of these things, but hot heat is gonna lead me to this, um, this uh, thyroid problem. Now, when you're on the low side, you're gonna lift the thyroid with levo. Okay, uh, the other term is Synthroid, same drug. Um, you make sure you take this drug in the morning on an empty stomach without any other meds. That's really important. Um, let me see, hang on just a second here. So there are down here, there's gonna be some other meds. This says meds, uh, this albate is radioactive iodine or we can remove the thyroid, but there's other meds to treat before we actually kill it out and remove the thyroid. There is PTU, remember? Propothyurus, that is the first line drug we would use to help somebody. Then there's something else called methmazole. You tap on the grave with methmazole. So it's tapazole or methmazole is the name of it. Uh, I'm sure I can find it down here. Hold on, give me a second. Mm. I think here's our meds down here. So if you look here, I'm going to say, let's give them this PTU. That's going to lower the thyroid, hopefully to get them to normal. Probably not. It's probably going to give them 
Hashimoto's, but <laughs> really important for this patient. It could give them a granulocytosis. Do you see this word here? A granulocytosis. What's that? A low white blood cells. Oh yeah. So if she says the patient's on PTU and their white blood cell count is this, mm, what do you what do you think? Could be sign of infection because of this problem right here. It's already going to lower them. Here's methmazole. Here's their other one. Uh, that's the like another choice. It's the other name of it's tapazole. So I say you tap on the grave with methmazole. And then there's some other things here. I don't know that they'll ask, but she may ask you, you could give this patient a beta blocker. And why would you give this patient a beta blocker? To take them out of, yeah, to take them out of the sympathetic <clears throat> system. Um, so Graves' disease, you know, you got to slow the poor person down. Um, hyperthyroidism, also, if we cannot control it, we may have to kill it out, right? Um, we may have to remove the thyroid, but you're not going to just go in and remove it. You're going to have to kill it out as much as you can. And radioactive iodine is a good way to do that because radioactive iodine uh, goes straight to the thyroid. Remember here, uh, there's some things that you're going to be radioactive when you're using this. And so it's like, uh, you're going to watch who you contaminate and everything like that over on this side. Um, use different bathroom. Don't, you know, really for like several days, you're not going to go around somebody else. Uh, we could last resort, do a thyroidectomy. Now here, I'm going to, I'm going to point something out. If we go in and we just, let's just say this. If we went in and we just took the thyroid out without killing it out first, we're going to have, we're going to dump a tremendous amount of thyroid hormone into the body, which would not be good. Even though we use radioactive iodine, when you take the thyroid out, we still can dump some thyroid hormone into the body and we could have a thyroid storm. So after thyroid removal, we've got to watch for a thyroid storm. Uh, one of the other things here is let's, uh, you, you and me, we're going to go in and the doctor's going to take out this thyroid and um, we're really close when we're taking out a thyroid to the vocal cords. I used to work in surgery and every once in a while, I, you know, with the, uh, in the OR as a ORRN, it's kind of boring, but every once in a while I wanted to be right there and see it and whatever. And so they let me every once in a while stand in and hold back, you know, so I can look. And I remember they were going to remove this girl's thyroid. And he said, you see this little string he lifted up with his little, whatever thing and he said this little string right here if i accidentally cut that she'll never speak again uh look <laughs> we got to be careful when we take the thyroid that we don't cut the vocal cords uh we want to lay them in a semi-fowler's position uh they may have a drain may not but here's the other important thing if we pull out the thyroid could we accidentally remove the parathyroids Sometimes what they'll do is they'll try to leave those little parathyroid in the body, but sometimes they're so tiny, they get taken out. So it may or may not be removed. Now, if they accidentally, so let's just say the test question said the patient had their thyroid removed and now something's wrong with their calcium. What might you think happened during surgery? They removed the parathyroid. Yes, ma'am. That's what you've got to think. And so that could cause a problem with our, uh, our calcium level, right? Um, remember, it could cause our calcium level to be low because the parathyroid raises it. So if they don't have a parathyroid, their calcium will be low. And what would you give the person if their calcium was low? Calcitrol. Calcitrol. We're going to trawl it up. We can give them that actual uh, drug, but you, might, you must put vitamin D with it because it won't work unless vitamin D opens the door for calcium to enter, okay? So those are important facts I just want you to know. You could 
affect the vocal cord, you could have removed the parathyroid, which would cause some, you know, calcium problems. And if you look here, um, the parathyroid gland, the hormone that it secretes, is, she, she may use the term parathormone, okay? If you have an increase in parathormone, then you have an increase in calcium. If you have a decrease in parathormone, you have a decrease in calcium. But remember that phosphorus and calcium are opposites. So when you get on that test, if calcium is low, your phosphorus is high. Um, also, one of the things you want to know, or you're watching for, when, if we accidentally remove them, would be the low calcium, right? And remember your Vostex and Trousseau's, what those look like. Because uh, I saw a question just on New World the other day, and it said something about the patient had their thyroid removed, and they put the blood pressure cuff on the person's arm and the hand curled. What could be the problem? Not could have removed the parathyroids and now they're showing that Trousseau's sign. So you see how it could just kind of work around in your mind and crazy stuff. Uh, but make sure you know that um, probably low calcium. So if we look here, I want you to see something that if, so all by itself, if we have low parathyroid or high parathyroid, what could we do? We're now we're not really talking about removal of it, but if it was low or if it was high, if the parathyroid is low, we're going to have low calcium, right? We could see tetany, laryngeospasms, Vostex, Trousseau's, those things. We would replace it with calcium gluconate and make sure you say vitamin D. You know why they say Tums on here? Tums for three to four days because they add calcium to, to us. They have calcium in it. Diet high in calcium, low in phosphorus is what you want. And then um, it says maybe the renal diet where no eggs and no milk. Hmm, that's interesting. No eggs and no milk. You would think milk would be important. But um, on page 1529, you can read about it. And whenever you're making your notes, and if when you go on to level four, Make sure you put page numbers with it. So if you have to go back, you can go back and look, right? Um, if you have hyperparathyroidism, you know, that's high calcium. Uh, how do we lower? Well, how would we get rid of high calcium in the body? What do you think? Calcitonin. Calcitonin. You tone it down with calcitonin. Wow, you guys are really doing good. Okay. <laughs> very good. Very good. So um, I'm going to go back and make sure we understand something. When we are very low on our thyroid, remember how we said myxedema coma? Remember, we, we might have to give IV levothyroxine because we got to bring it up. And so remember, everything is low. Uh, look, low salt, I wouldn't have guessed. Low blood sugar, low blood pressure, low pulse, low temperature. Everything's low. Over here in a storm, remember, now I know I said 106. I think the book says 101.3, but I'm going to say 106. Extreme tachycardia, but go with her, her fever. Exaggerated symptoms like weight loss, abdominal pain, cardiovascular. This, If you go into a storm too long, it can kill you because your heart can't beat that fast. Look, over 130, is this gonna, your whole system is sped up. Um, treatment, what are we going to do? Immediately take and get, let's get the temperature and the heart rate down. Uh, if you're in a storm, the first thing they usually give you is PTU. They usually try to lower the thyroid with that. Um, if they have uh, hypothermia, it says may need ice packs, cool environment, hydrocortisone, acetaminophen, Tylenol, aspirin are not used. Oh, it says aspirin is not used. Don't use aspirin, use Tylenol. Remember, NSAIDs have a little bit of aspirin in them. So I guess the drug of choice over here for pain or whatever, or fever would be Tylenol. Um, you might have some IV fluids containing sugar uh, to help replace the liver stores that have been depleted. Um, 
let's see, hydrocortisone, iodine, maybe given. Uh, just be aware that there's different things we could do, but we're going to have to lower the temperature and the heart rate. A good thing to lower the heart rate, well, obviously PTU is going to help a lot, but um, remember for hyperthyroid, we could give a beta blocker. All right, let me go and see if we missed anything. I know I kind of skipped around a little bit, but I wanted to make it mean something. Um, if you're going to do something called a radioactive iodine uptake test. We're going to see if the thyroid is even working. We could give a little iodine radioactively and watch to see if it all goes, if the thyroid takes it, because iodine goes straight to the thyroid. Um, so the thyroid needs iodine. Um, it needs it so bad that we add it to salt. And if you go to the grocery store, you can get iodized salt. The, the hard thing nowadays is there's a lot of health kicks out there, right? And so uh, people are doing like pink Himalayan salt, doesn't have iodine in it. So what you're going to see is more people who are lacking iodine are going to get goiters, which means the thyroid is going to become enlarged. So we want to measure how much the thyroid is taking the iodine up. It says the patient's given a little tracer and it measures, we can measure that. Uh, medications that can interfere with the test need to be held. So I would probably not guess this if it was me. I wouldn't have guessed that amiodarone, aspirin, maybe that's why aspirin, furosemide, heparin, lithium, anticonvulsants, and uh, beta blockers would be held during this test, okay? Because they can mess with it. Uh, foods high in iodine, look at, if your patient was really low in iodine and needed iodine, you could say, go eat some seaweed, go have fish and shrimp or other seafood, dairy products, milk, yogurt, cheese, uh, things from grains have uh, foods high in iodine. She may ask you about the foods. Okay. So be familiar with the foods. Just be familiar there. Okay. How are y'all feeling about thyroid? That's a big portion. I know. Um, let me go here. Hold on to sick. Let's go down to this one. All right, now here's our lovely adrenal gland that at first you didn't know where it was, but now you do. It's on top of the kidney, right? And remember the outer portion here is the cortex and the inner portion is the medulla. Tell me what comes off the cortex? Steroids. Yes, very good. What comes off the medulla? Very, very good. Okay. So you have to know that because if you have this biocrasatoma, I think, our, I don't know why, this is stupid, but I think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, biocrasatoma, <laughs> I don't know. Which is, it's a benign tumor. It's not malignant, but it will be inside of the medulla. Okay. And so what you'll see is because that's where you produce epi and norepi, this person's going to get a headache, sweat, palpitations. Look at the hypertension. Okay, you're working in the ER. A person comes in, you get your blood pressure. They're 250 over 150. What could that be from? Uh, they could have their, their adrenal medulla. That's a very, very high... If or like greater than that, if your if your blood pressure goes extremely high, it could be that you have a tumor, and this is where it is, right? So our mind needs to think like that for the test. Um, if you look here, five H's: headache, hypertension. I'm going to say hypertension. If you get a test question that says the high, the blood pressure is really high, you know, oh, that might be a tumor on the adrenal medulla. Um, so that might help you just the blood pressure itself. Um, but remember, they also get high sugar. They also get tremors. It's almost like everything goes up all of a sudden, but the, but the blood pressure is really high. Um, pa patient can panic uh, because guess what? Their whole body feels like it's fixing to explode. And so I would assume that they would panic. I think I would panic. <laughs> right um 
So let's go down here. Uh, so that's the tumor on the adrenal medulla. But now with our anti, uh, I mean, our anti, what is it? What is it? Adrenal cortotropic hormone. I couldn't think of the name. <laughs> when we're dealing with that, we're either dealing with Addison's or Cushing's. Now, I always say, and I would never want any of these diseases, but I always say if I had to have Addison's or Cushing's, I'd choose Addison's because you're tall, you're tan, you get a little dark pigmentation, you're skinny, uh, you know, all those things that everybody wants to be. Over in Cushing's, I wouldn't want a boom, moon face and a buffalo hump. <laughs> But not nobody else does either, but you know what I'm saying? So if you have to remember it like that, um, that would be a good way. Now, here's the deal. She's probably gonna target that, but she's also gonna target a couple of blood sugar, sodium and potassium. So in Addison's disease, remember, they have low blood sugar, almost just like a diabetic. They've gotta have some sugar. Uh, they have low sodium. What did I say about low sodium? It can go to the brain. Exactly. And they have high potassium, which does what? Dysrhythmias. Yes. They got some, they, so Addison's disease. <laughs> I know you're and Dan. I don't want all that. And so you treat them almost like a diabetic. I always say Addison's can have a whole bag of potato chips. They need that salt. And and we got to be careful with their potassium. Um, they do get very low blood pressure too. I don't know if y'all remember, there was a girl that used to work at the tutoring center. Her name was Anna and she had Addison's and every once in a while she would go, I need to, I got to go eat some sugar. I'll be back. And I'm like, are you okay? Uh, <laughs> you take your medicine. Um, over on the opposite side, I want you to think complete opposite of what we just looked at here. They're going to be hyperglycemic high salt, low potassium, and um, let's see here, osteoporosis because of, the, uh, uh, because of the steroids. And then there, oh, another thing, remember steroids, increase in steroids impairs wound healing because of the high sugar content. So they'll have problem with their bones and, and things like that. So here we're, here's what we're gonna do. If we have Addison's, we're going to treat them with what? Steroids. We're going to treat them with steroids. Yay. Um, what steroids might this person need to have? So prednisone. Uh-huh. Prednisone. And can you think of a mineral corticoid? You may not be familiar with one. Fleticazone is a mineral corticoid. They're going to have to have two types of steroids, a mineral and a glutocorticoid. There also may even have to have salt tablets. Have you ever seen anybody have to put salt tablet in their mouth? If they do, they, they have Addison's. Um, they need a diet high in carbs, high in protein with adequate sodium intake. And look at this. They need to carry an emergency kit of steroids. Wow. That's crazy, right? Um, right over here. Look, she's going to, the reason why I think she's going to ask you, do you need foods high in potassium on this side, low in sodium? So be aware what these are, the sugars, the salt, the potassium on both sides, and then add to it what you, in your mind they look like, okay? So this is kind of a good picture just to show you that, see how skinny they are and they're kind of tan over here. The helix kind of pale over here. Uh, he looks like his bone is broken. <laughs> These are just kind of good to help your mind walk around it. But in the, in the end result, this person could have vascular collapse over here in, in adrenal corticose insufficiency. So here's some labs. Um, look at the labs really carefully and say, oh, sodium and potassium. We know over here we're looking at that. Make sure you know and sugar, what's up and what's down on what side of the line, okay? Um, let me see here. All these you can read. I'm kind of pausing here, so if you wanted to pause your uh, video. Here's your steroids, okay? Um, a person who has Addison's will be on some steroids. I don't see fluticasone here. 
uh, you could go to your 1541 and look and see what medicines would be for each one. Uh, you can remember that steroids you taper off. You, you guys know that already, but is the Addison person ever going to go off steroids? Nope. Probably not. Will they ever get Cushing's? They could. <laughs> they could. They could, but probably not because they don't make mm -hmm. any. But they could. You're right. So who who would be more at risk for Cushing's would be somebody who uh, like has chemo and is on steroids for many, many, many months um, would probably send them to Cushing's. But Addison's, they have to have the steroids to survive. Otherwise, they're not going to live. And probably they're not going to, um, you know, they're probably not going to go over to be in a cushion. I'm just saying that. So uh, <laughs> just be aware. Yeah, hopefully not but i don't think they would so how do you feel about that so far pretty good all right so mm -hmm. make sure if i was to say to you acth what two diseases go with that acth since and cushing's Cushions. Yeah, if you get if you get mixed up on the diseases that go with it, you're gonna make that's gonna be a big downfall on your test. So you're gonna really need to like when you're studying this, say ACTH comes off anterior pituitary, Addison's and Cushing's. These are what it looks like. This is my signs and symptoms. This is how I treat it. Okay, and that's how you need to study this. If you can keep them all straight you're gonna do very good on this test. Now, another thing I wanna show you is, this is um, kind of cool and you may already know this, but you can go to, uh, let me move this around. There's, a, there's a two places that you could practice test questions, okay? Um, you can go to nurses labs and I'm gonna put questions on endocrine. Let's look at this. So my goodness, look, endocrine disorders, 50 questions. You can, you can practice in there. So if we were to, now when you go to nurses labs, it's gonna say, download this, download that, don't download everything, okay? But see, it says start now to download. You don't have to download anything, nothing, except for right here, look, we're going to get some questions. Now click on that. And what it will do is you should be able to go down to the bottom here. I know there's so many uh, questions. I mean, so many things that it looks like you should be able to click. I saw it says start the test, but sometimes down at the bottom, it will do be a little different. So, oh, there it is right there. Do you see how it gives us the test right here? Mm -hmm. uh, I love it because it gives you rationales that are really good. Um, that one was type 1 diabetes. Hang on. Okay, girls, let's do this one. A female adult client with a history of chronic hyperparathyroidism admits to being non-compliant. Based on initial assessment findings, nurse formulates the nursing diagnosis risk for injury. To complete the nursing diagnosis statement for this client, which would be related to phase should the nurse add? So risk for injury related to what? We've got hyper or chronic hyperparathyroidism. A. Okay, Oops. and let's get, let's check it out. Mm -hmm. Why was A correct? You have a high calcium. And because the house, the calcium is in the bloodstream, it's not in the bones, right? So related mm -hmm. to, oh, because it's the bone to mineralization. Very good. So what I would do is practice in here. Um, there's diabetes, skip the diabetes ones because they're also endocrine. I mean, you'll they'll probably give you more diabetes ones than anything. But look, 
hypothyroidism. The nurse Oliver should expect a client with hypothyroidism to report which health concern? Is it B? Would it be B? Well, they would, have, they would have Hashimoto's. They have Hashimoto's, you're right. So would that be puffy face and hand? Did you read that? No. What is their appetite when they have Hashimoto's? Is it up or is it down? Do they lose weight or do they gain weight? This is Graves, right? This is high. Yeah, they would gain weight. Okay. Nervous well, system tremors well. would be Graves. Thyroid gland swelling. Ooh, it could be low. Remember we said goiters with low thyroid. So could they have goiters with hyper and hypo? No, probably just low. Just low? Okay. I think so. Let's try this and see. I don't know if that is correct, but it's surely, oh, no, puffiness. Look at you guys. Well, you guys would have got that right. Uh, <laughs> let's find out why. Causes facial puffiness, extreme edema, and weight gain. All right. This is a very good place to, to do this, girls. The more questions you can push yourself over, the better you're going to do, okay? Because your mind's just got to really twist around it. Um, let's do this. I also want to show you, do you have the Orange Anklex book? Yes. Have you used it? This semester we have. <laughs> You haven't, or you have? We have this semester. Okay, so this, have you gone online to use it? No, we've just done the questions in the book. Okay, so this I'm going to show you. Uh, you've got to go online, and the, in the front of the cover is a little scratch off that will you can download it to your Evolve account, okay? Uh, this will help you from now on, so do it. Uh, Orange Inclux book right here. Uh, it says proceed with caution. I don't even know why, but just do it. And then um, we're going to go to students resources. And then we're going to go to exam review. And then we're going to let that orange box pop up whenever it does. And then we are going to continue. Okay. When you get here, there's a study thing right here. You can choose, uh, my favorite one is content area and health problem. But I want you, you can choose health problem. And over here, do you see maternity, mental health, newborn, pediatrics? This would have helped y'all so much in there. Adult health. Oh, look at this. Does it have endocrine? It sure does. Let's bring down that bar. Ooh, look, you can test yourself right here. I mean, you're gonna get some good questions. Now you could go to content area. There is also an adult health there, and there is endocrine, but it see it doesn't give you a drop down arrow to actually let you choose like you know, uh, like a detail, like you can't really choose the test question or the subject. I mean, so guys, use this, okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna stop now, and I'll I have to let this download, and then I will send you the video, okay? okay. Um, I think this can be super helpful for you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you are welcome. But practice, okay? Don't forget to do that. Get your mind twisting around that content and uh, organize your notes so you know where you put your stuff. All right. We'll see y'all later.